We pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you would fill our hearts with the light of your word. Lead us every day to confess our sins and to rejoice in your promise of full salvation. Help us also throughout our daily lives to love as we have been loved and to live as you would have us live to the glory of your name. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. As we come into the presence of our holy God, it is just and fitting that we make confession of our sins before him. We do so in the words that follow in our confession and absolution. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus 
Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us join and pray together. Almighty God, merciful Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. But I am sorry for my transgressions, and I pray you of your bountiful mercy to be gracious and merciful unto me. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Renew me by your spirit and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in you, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> first reading for this, the 22nd Sunday after Trinity, is found recorded in Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Throughout our worship this morning, we will be emphasizing the doctrine of sanctification. In other words, God's work in our hearts and in our lives that is revealed in our actions as we follow the Lord's will for our lives. In our first reading, the Apostle Paul encourages us to be imitators of God, not to imitate the world, but rather the God who has given us the perfect example of what we should be. We read from Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with the first verse. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Alleluia, alleluia. For there is one mediator, one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Alleluia. <laughs> rise for our gospel reading. Our gospel reading is found recorded in Luke chapter 11, verses 29 through 36. (laughs) 
verses of our gospel reading, Jesus makes an interesting declaration and comparison. He tells us that the people of the Old Testament cities that were destroyed by God for judgment would be better off than those of Jesus' own day who had the privilege of hearing his words and yet rejected it. We read from Luke chapter 11, beginning with the 29th verse. And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright, bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Here ends our gospel reading. We join to make confession of our faith in that God who has given us the light of his word and also a savior from our own dead works. We join to make confession of our faith in that triune God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The congregation may be seated. I invite the children to come forward this morning for the children's sermon. morning. So I have a question for you this morning. Have you ever been in a bad storm when all the lights went out? Anybody? Can't think of any. So if you, yeah, if you were, is that kind of scary? What do you usually do? What's the first thing you do if all of the lights are out and you're scared? Mark? Oh, go find a flashlight. What is a flashlight going to do? Yeah. Why do you need light? Why would you want to see? You might trip on something. That's right. That'd be, that wouldn't be very good. If you're walking around the house and it's completely dark and you trip on something, you could get hurt, couldn't you? Well... You know, over the next couple of weeks, I'd like to show you guys a bunch of pictures. Pictures are really important. Pictures tell us about things that are important in our lives. And so I have a, a picture that maybe you've seen before. You've seen this picture before? Yeah? Where have you seen that picture? Yeah, it's over there. This is one of our stained glass windows. 
And in this picture, what do you see? Mark, what's one thing that you see? A cup and a book. You guys see that? It's not really a cup. There's something unique about this cup. Do you see something strange about this cup? Yeah, you see the little flame right there? This is an old-fashioned lamp back before they had flashlights with batteries. They would have a lamp like this. It kind of looks like a cup, and they would put oil in it. And there would be a little wick, sort of like what we have on our candles, that would come out. They would light it, and it would shine a light, a fire, that would give light in the house. Now, this lamp is on top of a book. What do you think that book is? Okay. Yeah, it's the Bible. And this reminds us of a very important Bible passage. And I'm hoping you guys can say this passage with me. I'll say it once, and then we'll see if you guys can say it with me. This Bible passage comes from uh, the book of Psalms in chapter 119. And this is how it goes. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Do you think you guys can say that with me? Let's try. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Just like when a storm comes along and it knocks the lights out so that we can't see, we live in a world that is very dark, and God's word gives us light. It's like a flashlight or a lamp that shows us the way that we should walk so that we don't trip over something and fall down. It shows us the way that God wants us to walk throughout our lives. So as you see that stained glass window in our church, you see the lamp and you see God's word. Remember that passage. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we give you thanks that you have given us your word that we might know the way to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. We'll continue with the singing of the next hymn.
please rise. Every word of God is pure and has been recorded for our instruction in righteousness. That word of God, which we are considering this morning, is found recorded in the first psalm, Psalm 1, verses 1 through 6. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Here ends our sermon text. Please be seated. In the name of our Savior Jesus, who is not only our example, but also our salvation, your friends in Christ. The word of God, which we will consider today, is entirely sanctification. It's an encouragement of how we should live as Christians. And it's interesting to note that out of the 150 Psalms, this doesn't come at the end. It doesn't come in the middle. But it's the very first one. In these verses, the psalmist, probably David, lays out a contrast between believers and unbelievers. He speaks about what the believer is and what the believer is not. In these verses, we will consider a lesson from David regarding the life of a Christian. We will not neglect the motivation, which is Christ himself, and the salvation that he has won for us, that we might live such a life. We will be reminded, as the Psalms do so clearly, of pointing us to the Savior, who has paid our debt of sin when we have not lived in such a way and who is also the one who encourages us not to give up, but to continue to walk in the paths that he has laid before us, looking to his word, which is that lamp that leads our way through this life. This psalm is also a wonderful example of Hebrew poetry. The way in which I organize this psalm in your bulletin hopefully will draw your attention to some of the poetic features that are so prevalent throughout the Psalms of the Old Testament. One of the main features of Hebrew poetry was something that was called parallelism. There are parallelisms that emphasize or repeat a certain point. That's called synthetic parallelism. There's also parallelism that demonstrates the opposite point, which is called antithetic parallelism. As we consider this psalm, we will see a little bit of both of these types of poetry. In the very first part of our psalm, we see a synthetic type of parallelism as David emphasizes one thing after another what the man of God is like. In verse 1, he warns us about the dangers of sin in the world around us. David writes, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Notice the progression of the opening verse of the psalm. It's very clear as we take a look at the walking, the standing, and the sitting, a increasing comfortableness with sin. 
the psalmist emphasizes that the man of God, the child of God, the Christian, is not to put themselves in such a situation where they would be tempted into sin, that they would become desensitized by the sin of the world which it promotes and parades before us. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel, the ideas of the ungodly. And once they're comfortable with walking in the wisdom of the world, then becomes even more comfortable with standing in the very path, the way in which sinners live their lives. Coming, becoming comfortable with the way in which sinners live their lives, finally sitting in the seat of the scornful, even making fun of God and his truth and his word and those who follow God. A desensitization towards sin. We all have our struggles in life. Those particular problems in our lives or sins that we might be prone to. For the one who's an alcoholic and is leaving that alcoholism, recognizing how it has ruined their life, it's important for that alcoholic not to walk by the bar on his way home every night. The psalmist says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, who's careful who they surround themselves with that it might be a temptation that would lead them back into that bad way of life. Of course, the alcoholic certainly isn't going to walk into the bar and order a sandwich with a temptation right in front of them. Or say, well, you know, it's just one drink, it won't hurt. To an even greater degree, that is true of each one of us. With the things in which we we expose ourselves to in this evil and dark world. The psalmist encouragement is to each one of us. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, who does not surround himself with the wisdom of the world, who does not make his place in and among unbelievers where they encourage and tempt one into sin, nor the one who sits in the seat of the scornful. Solomon emphasizes in his wisdom the importance of good friends, godly friends, those who will encourage us, point us in the right direction when we are weak, when we are tempted. And how important that is for each one of us as well. We all have friends in the world, people that we've grown up with, people that we work with, that we enjoy their relationship, the times that we have together. But how much more important are those who share our faith, who are there in order to encourage us when we are tempted, when we are discouraged, when we are led astray. The desensitization that the devil uses in our world today is prevalent all around us. It's prevalent in the things that we read in books, in the TV shows, in the movies that we watch on TV. And we might think, it's okay, I, I, can, I can handle it. I recognize what is good and what is bad. But what about that show that you're sitting down and watching one night and your eight-year-old walks into the room and <laughs> sees this thing on TV that you know is not a good thing and says, Dad, what is that and why are you watching it? The old adage is you shouldn't watch anything that you wouldn't let your children watch. You shouldn't read anything that you wouldn't let your children read. One of the philosophies of the world is, well, I want to, I want to expose my children. I want to prepare them for what's in the world when they get older. The Bible doesn't follow such a philosophy. The Bible's adage is rather I'm going to protect my children for as long as I can because sooner or later they will see those things. We don't want to tell them that it's not out there, but as they are exposed to those things, we want to point them back to the light of God's word and show them why and how they are bad. 
They are evil. They are destructive, both for them and also for those around them. David warns us of the dangers of desensitization towards sin for ourselves, for our families, but also for us as a group of believers, as a church. The contrast to this desensitization to sin is found in verse 2 of our text. In contrast to the one who walks in the counsel of the ungodly, who stands in the path of sinners, and who sits in the seat of the scornful, David says, rather, the man who is blessed is the one who has his delight in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. One of the results that leads to desensitization is a lack of knowledge of God's word. When we remove ourselves from what God has revealed to us so clearly in his word, that, that book that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, when we are not familiar with what God has revealed in his word, we're going to be prone to fall into the temptations and the desires of the world, not knowing the difference between the two. The psalmist emphasizes here that the child of God, in order to prepare for the dangers of the world, must be immersed in the teachings of God's word. We should delight in the law of the Lord. Now keep in mind that when the Psalms emphasize the word law, that they don't simply mean the Ten Commandments. It's a broad term that describes all that God has revealed and declared in his word. Now, certainly, the law is an important aspect of that. If we don't teach our children the Ten Commandments and what those Ten Commandments teach about the way in which we interact with the world around us, we shouldn't be surprised when they come up to us and steal from others or when they hurt others. We should delight in the law of the Lord, teaching our children what is right and what is wrong according to God's word. The psalmist also says that in his law, this man who is blessed meditates day and night. Very early on in my ministry after we moved to Atlanta, we began homeschooling our oldest children at home. We weren't going to send them to the public schools. About two weeks after we moved there, we heard about a stabbing in the school just up the road that our children would have been attending. It wasn't just for that very reason that we decided to homeschool, but we learned very early on the importance of starting with family devotions. And that's been something that has been a part of our family throughout our younger children grow growing up. At times during our lives when things got busy, we would set the devotions aside and we'd move on to the busyness of life and it wasn't long that we began to realize just how much we were missing, how things were even worse because we weren't making God's word a priority in our lives. This is the emphasis of what the psalmist tells us today. Our delight should be in the law of the Lord and in his law we should meditate day and night, making his word an important part of our daily lives. It's easy to say, you know, I'm too busy today. I don't have time for my Bible reading or for our family devotions. We'll have to postpone it and do it tomorrow. Tomorrow comes, and tomorrow's just as busy as today was. We have to make the law of the Lord our focus, our delight, and upon it also our meditation. God reveals to us very clearly in his word how he blesses his people through his word. Think back to that stained glass window. The foundation for that light that leads us throughout life, not just with the good and the bad, the things that we should do and the things that we shouldn't do, but points us to our Savior who has opened up for us the door to heaven that we can't get into apart from him. We don't only emphasize the law to our children, but
but readily we point them to their Savior, to the one who has paid their price, their debt of sin, and for that reason has opened up the door to heaven for them. Throughout our lives, we'll be reminded time and time again that we are sinners, that we have failed. We'll be reminded of our own great sin against God. The law of God doesn't do us any good in that situation. We're already reminded of how bad we are and how we failed to live, to live up to God's standards. But we need to be then pointed to our Savior, to the work of His salvation for us through His perfect life and His substitutionary death. The psalmist reveals also the contrast between the believer and the unbeliever. In verses 4 through 6, the psalmist writes, The ungodly are not like the believer. They are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly <coughs> shall perish. The ungodly are not so but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. How appropriate an illustration at this time of the year in this part of the country. As you see the combines driving through the fields, chomping up the beans and the corn and spitting out the chaff at the back. How the wind picks it up and blows it away. What is harvested is there in the combine, in the trailer, being taken and hauled off to be used, but here's the illustration that the ungodly are not like that. They are not beneficial. They're like the chaff, which is simply blown away. In the old days before combines, the farmers would go out with a fork and a, and a shovel of some kind and they would take the grain and they would throw it up in the air. The grain was heavier so it would drop down to the ground, but the wind would catch the, the covering, the chaff, and it would carry it away. It was worthless. There's a difference between the believer and the unbeliever. David speaks of the believer in a very different way. In verse 3, he says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Another illustration here is a tree, not just any tree, but a tree that is full of nutrients. It's planted close to a water source. It has fruit that it bears. Its leaves do not wither. And whatever the believer does, he says, will prosper. As we look out the window at this time of the year, we see all of the trees dropping their leaves as they wither for preparation of another winter. The psalmist here reminds us that that is not the case for the believer. Their leaf does not wither. Rather, through the life that Christ has given to us, we continue to live before him. Who is it that lives? He uses the word here, the righteous. In verse 6, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Who is the righteous? What makes a person righteous? Many people, people would say, well, I'm a whole lot better than my neighbor, so I'm righteous in comparison to someone else, but that's not the righteousness that the, righteousness that the Psalms speak of. The righteousness that not only the Psalms, but all of Scripture speak of, that is ours by faith is the righteousness of Christ. We are only righteous in and through Christ's act for us, in his perfect life, in his obedience to the command of his Father, in our place and as our substitute. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. It isn't directly spoken in the verses of our psalm. 
he speaks directly about the end result of the unbelievers. The ungodly will not stand in the judgment. Sinners will not stand in the congregation of the righteous. The ungodly will perish. But you notice what is also unspoken but still true? That the contrast of that is also true. The godly shall stand in the judgment. The righteous will stand in the congregation of the Lord. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. The contrast here between the unbeliever whose way perishes is the opposite of what the believer receives. The believer receives that promise of life from his or her Savior for the last day. Their leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The Lord promises his blessing to his people, to those who meditate and dwell on his word, who are built up in the truth of his word, who are reminded that when we fail, they have a Savior, a Savior that has lived and died for them, that has given them a hope and a future, not on this life, not on this earth, but in the world to come. The Apostle Paul, writing to the believers in Philippi, emphasized the things that we should set our minds on in this life. Paul writes, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything is worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Blessed is the man who does not walk who does not stand, who does not sit in the way of the world, but rather whose delight is in the law of the Lord. As we consider those things that are pure and lovely and of good report, most important of all is God's word, which points us to the only one who was good, to Jesus, to our Savior. May we make this our meditation, our delight, May we direct our children and our grandchildren, those around us, to that thing, that Savior, who is our delight, and who is, thanks be to God, our salvation. Amen. <clears throat> May that peace of God, which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. <clears throat>
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who makes all things to work together for good to those who love you, we give to you thanks for all things in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. We thank you for your mercy in times of health, prosperity, and peace, as well as for your fatherly correction in times of adversity and trouble, and for your goodness in the love of family and the companionship of friends, for your strengthening help when we are tempted. But most of all, we thank you for the gift of your own dear Son, by whose death and resurrection you have brought us to yourself and strengthened us to do what is pleasing in your sight. Grant, O Father in heaven, that we may be filled with your Holy Spirit, that we might have an understanding of your word and power to live faithfully in it, in obedience and in love. Enlighten our minds that we may take hold of every opportunity to do good unto others and to occupy our minds and our hands with useful work. Transform our sinful hearts that we may find joy in the worship of you and in the fellowship of your people. O Lord, who is Lord over all, we ask for your blessing also upon our own land. Revive among the people of our nation a high regard for honor, truth, purity, true religion, and the works of faith. Give to our leaders sound judgment that they may govern our land in wisdom and preserve us from those who would destroy the freedoms which you have so graciously given to us. Teach our families to call upon you for every need and to provide them in due time with all that they need both for their body and for their soul. We ask that you would be with those people in Haiti, both believers and unbelievers, as they struggle with the devastation that has taken place. We ask that you would lead this tragedy to point people to you as the one and only Savior for sinners. Grant to all those who are in sickness or in sorrow, trouble or in danger, an increase of faith and love. We pray especially for the Moss and the Volker family at the time of this loss of their loved ones. We ask that you would keep them and comfort them through your mighty hand and relieve them of their distress. We ask all of these things, O Lord, in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.